about a week before Michigan snatched the attention of the college basketball world with unexpected wins over North Carolina and Gonzaga at the Battle for Atlantis tournament in the Bahamas, the Wolverines assistant coach Phil Martelli was as concerned about the casinos there as he was about the basketball games. Michigan's new head coach, Juwin Howard, who had never coached in college before this season, was preparing for his team's first trip. Martelli, who had spent the last 24 years dealing with college athletes as the head coach at St. Joseph's in Philadelphia, wanted to know what the team's policy would be on players entering the gambling halls in the resort where they were staying. I'm not sure that the question had even crossed his mind, since he is so used to dealing with grown men in the NBA, Martelli said of Howard, who was an assistant for the Miami Heat before taking the job in Ann Arbor. Howard ultimately decided that no players would be allowed on the casino floors, regardless of age. He thanked me for bringing it to his attention, Martelli said. It's his program, so he doesn't have to listen to me. But I feel heard, and that's very important. It's part of why I wanted to come here. Martelli is one of college basketball sages, the successful former head coaches who now sit at the right hand of relatively inexperienced current head coaches and help them navigate the college hoops mountain. Howard's hiring at Michigan was part of its own trend, a wave of hires in which athletic directors reached back into their university's past and turned to a successful player to try to rekindle that old magic. Penny Hardaway, who was an all-star guard for the Orlando Magic, took over at Memphis in 2018. Aaron McKee took over at Temple in 2019 after 13 seasons in the NBA and several years of being an assistant under Fran Dunphy. Patrick Ewing, the Knicks great, returned to Georgetown three years ago to lead the Hoyas with a resume similar to that of Howard, who was a member of Michigan's so-called Fab Five recruiting class in the early 1990s. No one doubts the basketball bona fides of these NBA veterans, but college basketball, with its massive NCAA rulebook and academic requirements, presents a management challenge that is different from the NBA game. To wit, several of these new hires brought in experienced college coaches to aid in their transition. Ewing hired Lewis Orr, who played with Ewing on the Knicks in the mid-80s. As a coach, or guided Seton Hall to two NCAA tournament appearances in five seasons. McKee has both Monty Ross, a former head coach at Delaware, and Mark Macon, who served as the head coach at Binghamton and was one of Temple's best players. Vanderbilt's new coach, the former NBA. All-star Jerry Stackhouse, hired the former Colorado coach Ricardo Patton as a special assistant. The roles for these assistant coaches vary by program. Sometimes, they are asked to be a cooler head in intense situations. During a recent game against Duke at Madison Square Garden, his old stamping grounds, Ewing was on the verge of an ejection for arguing with the referees over what he thought was a phantom foul call. It was his former teammate Orr who stepped in front of Ewing and kept the peace. Lewis Orr has been an integral part of our program and our success, Ewing said. All of my assistants have been in college sports for a lot of years, while my background is more in the NBA. So I can lean on them for the things that I need to learn about the college game, like recruiting, even though on the court we run more NBA, type stuff. So he's been an important part of our family, even if he used to wear the orange, Ewing added, referring to Orr's college days at rival Syracuse. At Michigan, Martelli has been important to the team for his knowledge about the logistics of running a program. He was perhaps the most successful coach in the history of St. Joseph's when he was unceremoniously fired at the end of last season after 24 years with the team. Because of his personality, he had offers to go into television, but he felt he was not done with coaching. He realized his phone would not ring on its own, and started asking friends about assistant gigs in the Power Five conferences. Howard was hired at Michigan in May after John Bylian left the program for the NBA, becoming the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Word circulated in coaching circles that Howard was looking for an experienced hand to help him. Kentucky coach John Colley Perry reached out to Martelli to gauge his interest, and Martelli jumped at the opportunity. 
I just couldn't imagine being on TV and calling a game between, like, Villanova and St. John's, and seeing a great game and then just going home by myself after it was done, Martelli said. I needed the exhilaration that comes from winning or the despondency of losing. I needed to be a part of a team. The results for the hires that call back to glory days have been mixed. For every Fred Hoiberg, who returned to Iowa State after an NBA career and led the Cyclones to four NCAA tournaments in five seasons, there is a Clyde Drexler, whose two-year stint at Houston set the program back. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, appointed Brigadier General Ismail Khani as the new leader for the Quds Force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps on Friday, Iranian news agencies reported. General Khani, 62, was promoted from deputy commander of the Quds Force, hours after a United States drone strike killed his predecessor, Major General Qasim Soleimani. General Khani became deputy commander of the force in 1997, when General Soleimani was named as chief commander, according to Reuters. Ayatollah Khomeini said the program of the Quds Force would be unchanged from the time of his predecessor. The United States Treasury Department put General Connie on a blacklist in 2012 for what it called financial disbursements to various terrorist groups, including Hezbollah. In 2017, General Connie was reported as warning that Iran had buried many, like President Trump. We are not a warmongering country, he said at the time, according to the semi-official news agency Tasnim. But any military action against Iran will be regretted. Large crowds gathered for Friday prayer in Iran and filled public squares with mass protests, while officials met privately to plot strategy and leaders vowed to avenge General Soleimani's death. Images broadcast on Iranian state television showed hundreds of supporters of General Soleimani gathered in mourning outside his house in the southeastern town of Kerman, and later footage shows thousands gathered on the streets. The great nation of Iran will take revenge for this heinous crime, President Hassan Rouhani wrote on Twitter. Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif called the strike an act of international terrorism. Iran was working with Iraqi officials to repatriate the general's body for a funeral service, perhaps as soon as Saturday, a number of Iranian journalists reported. Iran's Supreme National Security Council also held an emergency meeting. According to people with knowledge of the discussion, Council members received a written order from Mr. Khomeini that ordered that Iran strike America directly and in exact proportion to the attack. In Iraq, the strike appeared likely to accelerate calls for the departure of American troops. Along with General Soleimani, it killed Abu Mahdi al-Mohandis, the leader of a powerful militia that is backed by Iran but technically under the umbrella of the Iraqi military. Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi of Iraq praised Mr. Al Mohandas and General Soleimani as heroes in the fight against the Islamic State and condemned their killing as a brazen violation of Iraq's sovereignty and a blatant attack on the nation's dignity. Iraq's parliament plans to convene an emergency session on Saturday to address the strike, which could accelerate calls to push United States forces from the country. The starting point of the recent escalation in tensions between the United States and Iran began with the 2018 decision by President Trump to withdraw from a landmark nuclear agreement with Iran signed in 2015 by the United States, China, Russia, Britain, France, and Germany. Many experts said on Friday that any new negotiations to save the nuclear deal, known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, were now unlikely. The Russian Foreign Ministry called the killing of General Soleimani an adventurist step that will increase tensions throughout the region, according to local news agencies. Soleimani served the cause of protecting Iran's national interests with devotion, the ministry added. A spokesman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry called for restraint on all sides, especially the United States. China has always opposed the use of force in international relations, the spokesman, Geng Chuang, said at a daily news briefing, according to news agencies. Britain's Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, called on Friday for a de-escalation in tensions and said that further conflict in the region was not in his country's interest. 
we have always recognized the aggressive threat posed by the Iranian Quds force led by Qasem Soleimani, Mr. Rob said in a statement. Following his death, we urge all parties to de-escalate. Charles Michel, President of the European Council, said in a statement, the cycle of violence, provocations, and retaliations which we have witnessed in Iraq over the past few weeks has to stop. Further escalation must be avoided at all cost. Federica Mogherini, the European High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy, said on Twitter that the general's killing was an extremely dangerous escalation. The killing of General Soleimani most likely violated international law, Agnes Calamard, the United Nations expert on extrajudicial executions, said in a post on Twitter. Use of lethal force is only justified to protect against an imminent threat to life, Ms. Calamard wrote. An individual's past involvement in terrorist acts is not sufficient to take his targeting for killing legal, she said. Use of drones for targeted killings outside active hostilities was almost never likely to be legal, she added. In France, President Emmanuel Macron had yet to react, but the country's junior minister for European affairs, Amélie de Montchelin, said that she would soon consult with countries in the region. We have woken up to a more dangerous world, Ms. de Montchelin told French Radio, calling for stability and de-escalation. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel cut short an official visit to Greece and was returning to Israel on Friday, while his ministers mostly kept silent in an apparent effort to avoid undue Iranian attention. Before boarding the plane, Mr. Netanyahu praised President Trump for acting swiftly, forcefully, and decisively. Israel stands with the United States in its just struggle for peace, security, and self-defense, he said. Hamas, the Islamic militant group that controls the Palestinian coastal territory of Gaza, offered its condolences to Iran on the death of Major General Qasem Soleimani, saying in a statement that he had played a major and critical role in supporting Palestinian resistance at all levels. Hamas condemned what it called U.S. bullying that it said served the interests of Israel. Israel's rookie defense minister, Naftali Bennett, held consultations at military headquarters in Tel Aviv and released a photograph of the meeting attended by the military chief of staff, the Mossad chief and other security officials. Some Israeli opposition politicians issued congratulatory messages. Moshe Yalin, a former military chief and defense minister and now a leader of the centrist Blue and White Party thanked the Americans for what he called a determined and precise operation. The world and the Middle East have been freed today from an arch-murderer, he said, adding, good riddance. General Soleimani, a longtime adversary of Israel, was credited with overseeing many attacks against Israeli and Jewish targets and he was linked with an attack on the Israeli embassy in Argentina in the 1990s. More recently he was behind military actions from Syria, across Israel's northern frontier. Israel has long been locked in hostilities with Iran, attempting to thwart its entrenchment in Syria and halt its transfer of advanced weapons to Hezbollah, an Israeli foe, in Lebanon. Early Friday, the Israeli military announced the closure of a ski run in the northern Golan Heights that borders Syria. Israeli embassies abroad were reportedly placed on high alert. Reporting was contributed by Ben Hubbard, Farnas Fasahi, Elian Peltier, Megan Speckia, Isabel Kirshner, Ronan Bergman, Katie Edmondson, and Nick Cumming-Bruce.